the Upper South. So you can see here that I'm using that same map. So this, like I said before, is a great map to be looking at when you're looking at where is the Upper South versus the Lower South. So you can see here that the Upper South includes states like Delaware, Maryland, Kentucky, Missouri, uh, Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Arkansas. Here we're going to see the institution of slavery is still entrenched, but it's a bit less dominant. Part of the th reason for this is the Upper South region generally lacks like the really fertile soil that the Lower South has, as well as the long growing season that was really necessary for a lot of the slave crops like cotton, rice, or sugar. And so because of that, we're actually gonna see that the institution of slavery is gonna be less dominant and the demand for enslaved people is less. Um, there is this period of economic adjustment when we're looking at like the 1820s and 30s in the upper southern region. The thing is a lot of people in this region are going to actually move west at this time to like Arkansas and Missouri, um, but there's this period of basically they have to have agricultural reform. It's going to be like promoting the use of marl, which was like calcium rich sea cell, seashell deposits that would like neutralize overly acidic or worn out soils. Um, a lot of farmers are called to, you know, for deeper plowing or systematic rotation of crops or even um, breeding more stock for like animal husbandry purposes. And this is met with some success, but a lot of people during this time period are going to move west rather than trying to reform their agricultural methods. There's also going to be the fact that a minority really could ever embrace this reform. A lot of times only the well-educated or those who could afford to do so are gonna be able to make these kinds of changes. Really, the trend is going to be more and more sort towards agricultural diversification. And with this agricultural diversification, that means that now people are going to move towards like producing grain or livestock for urban markets, uh, wheat, corn, garden vegetables actually became a major cash crop, partly because um, you have to feed a lot of like the northern cities and everything that aren't going to necessarily have farms, you know, in the middle of New York City. And so that's what really happens. But as people move to this agricultural diversification, basically this lessens their dependence on enslaved labor. We're also going to see in this upper southern region a growing urbanization. They have considerably greater urbanization here than in the lower south. In fact, um, you can see this in the manufacturing as well. So for instance, the Upper South is going to account for 75% of the entire South's manufacturing, capital, and output. But this really means the economy of the Upper South is a lot more balanced. It's a lot less tied to just plantation agriculture and thus a lot less tied to enslaved labor. You're also going to see things like a labor market for like railroad construction and manufacturing. And these kinds of jobs attract Northern immigrants that kind of helps compensate for the loss of native born population moving out west. But this also means that you're getting a lot more free labor. Now, when I use the term free labor, don't think like they weren't paid. Free labor would be like what we have as a society today that they are not enslaved. They are free to choose their job and then work that job and everything. And so we're going to see that planters in the Upper South were really concerned that this free labor might replace the very expensive and coming more and more scarce enslaved labor. And in fact, they were kind of right to a certain point. There is going to be the decline of slavery over time in the Upper South. Um, in fact, by like the 1850s, only in Arkansas is there going to be an increase in slavery. And even there, 
in the enslaved population only made up about 25 percent of the population which is a huge difference compared to like you know south carolina part of the lower south that um it, slaves actually made up a majority of the population on top of that if you think back to the uh, video before this in every decade since uh, 1820, the internal slave trade drained off about 10% of the slaves in the Upper South into the Lower South. We saw that with the heirs, they were generally selling slaves more and more often in the Upper South to the Lower South. And this is basically getting rid of all of the natural increase of those enslaved. This is partly because a lot of these people who were selling their enslaved human chattel would basically, um, they're like embarking on like agricultural reform or they're like shifting out of like tobacco production. And a lot of their investment might be flowing into other things like economic diversification and expanding urban or manufacturing enterprises rather than investing in more enslaved people. This increasingly also puts slavery at a competitive disadvantage against free labor. The thing is, manufacturing generally wants workers that could be hired and fired at a moment's notice. Think about if you, for instance, were manufacturing like winter coats, you're probably going to want to manufacture more of them during like the winter months. So you wanna be able to hire and fire people so that you can have more seasonal employment to a certain extent, but if you own slaves you still have to feed and clothe them year round and so you're not going to actually make as much of a profit than if you actually had free labor and so we see like immigrant workers would oftentimes displace those who were enslaved in factories and really slavery as an institution is on economic retreat across the upper south after about 1830. now keep in mind it's still a, a very dominant position but it is in this retreat